alongside Tim Wallman. And it's our pleasure now to bring in our guest uh, by phone. And we're going to talk to Dr. TV Troy and, uh, pardon me, Tevi Troy. And Dr. Troy, thank you for joining us today. We want to talk about your book. And it's interesting, uh, our conversation just before this, but your book is what Jefferson read, Ike watched, and Obama tweeted. 200 years of popular culture in the White House. I wonder what President Obama is tweeting today, sir. That's a good question, but you can follow his Twitter account. There's 30 million followers, and when there is a tweet that comes directly from the president himself as opposed to one of his aides, it says B.O. at the end. So you know that's a direct President Obama tweet. Wow. Now, you serve as self, uh, senior fellow at the Hudson Institute, and you uh, are you're, you're a... Uh, presidential historian I, yeah. I am but i've also been a former white house aide so i've, I've both looked from the inside and the outside I'm okay president. now uh, it's described as a high level white house aide what a, yeah i was a i was domestic policy advisor i was a okay deputy assistant to the president for domestic policy under bush and then acting assistant and ran the domestic policy council Wow. Well, tell us about this. This is an interesting, uh, your, uh, your, your book is titled What Jefferson Read, Ike Watched, and Obama Tweeted. That's a very interesting title. What are, you, what, are you, what are you exploring here? Yeah, well, I was trying to convey a couple of things with the title, and I appreciate you, you looking at that. First, I was trying to get that I have the range of presidents from our earliest. Right. I mentioned Jefferson because he was a big reader, but I do start with Washington. Mm-hmm. Ike Watched, uh, because uh, I, I do cover what... Um, what happened in the television era, and then Obama tweeted. So I have the whole gamut of presidents from the beginning. But also the cultural shift from reading, since reading and live entertainment were the only forms of entertainment available to our earliest presidents, to TV, which is something you watch and you see active images, but it's still somewhat you're a passive recipient, to tweeting, which is a new technology, obviously, that allows the president to interact and actually to shape the culture and to, and to shape what's being said. So presidents have had more options, not only for what they take in as a result of technology, but also for how they convey their own mes- messages and portray their images in the press. I'm just curious, back in uh, the 1700s and the 1800s in particular, uh, how did the message get out to the country on what was going on with the presidency? Because, uh, you know, you didn't have, uh, I don't even know if you had newspapers. I mean, I guess you had newspapers, but, you know, how did they know? They didn't have reporters that could call their story in, you know, back home from Washington back to you know, <laughs> Dallas or something like that. You had horseback. Or right. That. So how did, how did the message get out to the country on what the president was doing and so they could measure whether he was doing a good job or not, wanted to reelect him or not, and those kinds of things? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question, and I would say slowly. You did not have the obsessive 24-hour, seven-day-a-week cycle that you have now where you know everything the president does at any time, and thanks to Twitter, you know his thoughts. So you knew less, and you didn't know it as quickly. And this has happened very fast that we, that we know so much so quickly. I tell a story in the book about Don Rumsfeld when he was chief of staff under Ford. There was a big story that was coming out, and the story was uh, – something that Newsweek had, and it was a Sunday, and he says in his memoirs that, well, Newsweek had it, so it wouldn't be able to be printed till the next Sunday, so we had a week to deal with this. So this immediate knowledge of what's going on is really a new phenomenon, not just changed from the 17th, 1700s, but from even the 20th century. That would, have been, yeah, that would have been in the 1970s. Yeah. You're talking about when you're talking about Rumsfeld and the, pre- the four presidency. So, so um the uh, news traveled slowly out across the country. Of course, our country was basically rural. I mean, you had a few big cities, but, um, you know, a lot of our country in the 17, 1800s, you know, there wasn't a lot of people here. Yeah, in, 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 in the in, There wasn't a lot of people here in, in the U.S. But the people who were here were very literate. Yes. They were well-read. Yes. So they, they did read a lot, and they read what was available, even though they didn't have quite as much material. But in terms of how the president got the word out, I have a whole chapter in the book about 19th century presidents and the theater and how if they wanted to get out and see the people, they couldn't do a YouTube video or go on TV. They would go to live performances because that's where the people assembled. And I talk about President Monroe, who would go on a goodwill tour. He went to South Carolina, which is one of the theatrical 
capitals in Charleston, was one of the theatrical capitals of the U.S., and he went to different plays to, to see and be seen, to show his face, and so that the people would see him and know more about him. How did the television age change uh, yeah. the way the president you know, communicated with the American people or interacted with the American people? Yeah, the, the president had to be a lot more careful. There was less margin for error. When you go on TV, you are seen and you know, can be permanent. It's, those images can, can get recorded, although it's a lot easier to do it now. Eisenhower actually launched his campaign in 1952 with a disastrous speech that did not go off well, and they wondered if the campaign wouldn't go any further than that, and then he kind of regrouped and gave a better TV speech the, the next day. But, yeah, presidents had to adjust to TV, and some did it better than others. In fact, John F. Kennedy, after his successful 1960 campaign against Nixon, Kennedy was clearly the better TV candidate, and he said at one point after the election, he passed by a TV, and he said, you know, we wouldn't have had a chance without that gadget. <laughs> wow. Well, so was, was Eisenhower the first president to appear on television, or was that uh, – FDR really he was didn't – He was the F first to do a televised press conference. Okay. Uh, FDR there were didn't. images of Truman on TV, but not that many people had TVs back then. But, um, but, but Eisenhower was the first one to do a, a – a, a televised press conference. He was the first one to uh, have a TV consultant who'd worked in the, the TV business. Uh, he gave speeches on TV. His famous speech where he talked about the military-industrial complex was on TV. So he really was a pioneer in the use of TV, even though John F. Kennedy usually gets credit for being the TV revolutionary. Well, it was FDR who used the fireside chats for radio, right? Yeah, and, and I talk about in the book how the, the fireside chats, I think, are not fully appreciated today. People just think, oh, yeah, he was going on the radio all the time. FDR was very careful about his use of the fireside chats. He only did them a couple of times a year. He actually thought that Winston Churchill was overexposed because he went on the radio too often. FDR also carefully thought about the words he used. He only used simple words, and he wanted them to appeal to the American people so that they would understand what he was talking about. He had a little whistle when he spoke, and he put a false tooth in to alleviate the whistle when he went on the radio. <laughs> really? He even used special paper that didn't rustle so people would think he was talking off the cuff. Wow. <laughs> That's incredible. This is the program of Today's Issues on American Family Radio, and we're talking to Teve Troy, and we are discussing his book, What Jefferson Read, Ike Watched, and Obama Tweeted. 200 Years of Popular Culture in the White House. And in the book, uh, you, you talk about music and its role in the White House as well. Absolutely. Music has been very important, especially in the 20th century with the rise of radio and music could go anywhere. But music was seen as kind of a, at least popular music, was seen as a somewhat subversive force in the 1950s and even 60s. Think about Elvis going on the Ed Sullivan show and having his hip gyration censored and blacked out. So the early presidents in the rock and roll era really had nothing to do with rock and didn't want to interact with rock. In fact, Nixon, in the 70s, wanted to appeal to country music stars. He liked um, Merle Haggard's song, Oki from the Stogie, which kind of rejected the liberal uh, excesses of um, pot smoking and, and draft dodging. <laughs> and so he even had an event at the White House with Merle Haggard in an, a, a, an attempt to reach out to the silent majority. Um. You mentioned uh, fireside chats, and uh, then you mentioned the age of television came along, and now social media. But television in particular, you had to adjust, as uh, John F. Kennedy said, he was a very photogenic man, mm -hmm. very uh, personable, it came across well on television such that it was there in the late 50s and early 60s. But, uh, man, today... Is that good or bad? Because you can, you can, uh, a man can be, uh, or a woman for that matter, can be removed from the race, even though they might be the most intelligent one or have the best plan because they make a couple of faux pas, you know, on television interviews. I mean, you look what happened to uh, Sarah Palin, and, you know, whatever you think about Sarah Palin, mm -hmm. good or bad. Uh, look what happened uh, in terms of her ability to be vice president or president. But look, one interview basically, you know, took her <laughs> took her out of the uh, mix. And then you had, uh, that, that, that was with, what's her name, Katie Couric mm -hmm. or something like yeah, that? Katie Couric. I mean, really, I'm, I'm, so television can do a lot of, unless you're Joe Biden, which, right. 
<laughs> which are, you know he's going to be in the next he's going to be in the remake of the Three Stooges. You, well, you just <laughs> yeah, that's an insult to the Three Stooges. Jim. I'm sorry. <laughs> you would, uh, but anyway, you can you can get you can be hurt, uh, you can be damaged. Uh, or I guess on the other side, uh, like Dave J- Cash said, you could be helped, can't you? Tevi? television. I'm talking about. Yeah, t- TV can make or break you, and I think of 2004 when Barack Obama gave that speech Mm -hmm. at the Democratic National Convention. I had never seen him speak before, and I looked at that speech, and I said to my wife, this guy is going to be president. He's that impressive. At the same time, television can can really kill a political campaign, and I tell a story in the book about Ted Kennedy talking to Roger Mudd in 1979 when a lot of people thought he was going to defeat Jimmy Carter in the Democratic primaries, and Roger Mudd asked a pretty simple question, which is, why do you want to be president? And Kennedy gave this just awful, stumbling answer that I that I recreate verbatim in the book, and it's just embarrassing, and it really harmed Kennedy's ability to to have a campaign going forward, and also just uh, he was he was mocked and derided for it for a long time afterwards. Did did anybody use TV better than Reagan? Uh, Reagan's definitely up there. I, I think Obama has been good on TV to some degree. Certainly, his uh, his prepared speeches, he can have that soaring rhetoric. Kennedy was obviously groundbreaking, uh, but but Reagan was really a master. And and you got to give him credit for it. He uh, I mean he he came from Hollywood. He knew what he was doing. In fact, there's there's one story I heard about how Nancy and he were were fighting over some kind of TV spot, and he looked over to her and he said, "You know, Nancy." I have done this before. <laughs> <laughs> he, he, yeah, he was a, a trained actor, but but he didn't come across as acting. Well, maybe that's a good thing about actors, right? You don't know they're you know they're so good. You, they they but I mean he he really came across. I'm talking about Reagan here as uh, you know authentic and genuine, uh, connected with the American people. Yeah, and I think that's a really important point because. You just can't fake it. I mean, you can't pretend to know everything about culture. And then you know, somebody asks you a difficult question, like, uh, what, what books are you reading? And then not really read the books. So, so you can't fake this stuff. And Reagan really did have that ability to appear genuine, to appear sincere. And I talk in the book about some of his, his press strategists, and they said, you got to remember this guy was an actor. He always hit his marks. This is the program, Today's Issues, on American Family Radio. We're talking to, to Tevi Troy, and he's the author of what Jeff, Jefferson read, Ike watched, and Obama tweeted. Uh, Tevi, as we look at this, how? and I know this is probably an ignorant question, so let me apologize in advance, but as you look at Facebook, as you look at the social media, as you look at Twitter, you know, uh, Mrs. Obama even has uh, an Instagram account, you know, or Pinterest, I think, or maybe both, where she continues to put stuff out. How powerful has that really been, and is that part of what cost uh, the, you know, how well he uses that? Is that what what helped him through the election? You know, there's this really funny video out from Second City Network where they talk about liberals disappointed with Obama on Syria, and that one of the people who's kind of a classic twenty-something says, "When I first heard about Barack Obama." in a YouTube clip posted to my Facebook page. Right. So it really talks about how he did reach out and how he reached so many young people through the social media. And I, I think he was clearly groundbreaking on that front, uh, and so much more so, obviously, than John McCain, who was a non-starter there. And Romney's team tried, but they, they weren't as good. So, yeah, I think social media is important, and you look at the Twitter accounts of the possible 2016 candidates, and they're all... They're all pretty active and up and running. So I think it is a great way to reach a lot of people, to segment your audience, to find the people who might be interested in what you have to say. Mm-hmm. And especially in these days of narrow casting. When I was growing up in the 1970s, Happy Days was on, and everybody watched it, and everybody talked about it. And you know, there's had tens of millions of people watching it. Even the most successful shows today don't have that many people watching it. So even the most successful show is a show that the majority of the American people have never, ever seen. Mm-hmm. No, because it, there's so many shows out there. I want to ask you, we've got two or three minutes here, and uh, I wanted to ask you about uh, one of the most 